Okay. Welcome everyone uh, to this evening's conversation. Uh, we're very proud um, to present this uh, evening to you on this important topic. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm the Director of Development and Programming with the Bedford Playhouse. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to our uh, moderator and panelists in a second. Uh, first, a couple of very quick housekeeping things. Um, for those of you who are not familiar yet with Zoom uh, in this self-quarantining world, uh, there is a Q&A option. If you are on your computer, uh, it's at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A button for you to ask questions at any point. Um, please feel free to type in your questions and they will get answered uh, at the end when we do the Q&A session. Uh, if you're on your iPad, I believe it's actually on the top of your screen. Um, but you should be able to find it. Um, there's also a poll feature. Ellen will talk about that in a minute uh, that has some poll questions, but we'll let her introduce that. Um, if you enjoy this evening uh, and find it interesting and worthwhile, uh, this is we're very proud again uh, as the Bedford Playhouse to be able to present these types of programs to you while we're all operating virtually. So on behalf of the Playhouse and on Bedford 2020, uh, all of your support is much appreciated. If you're so inclined, please consider visiting our websites, our respective websites, and perhaps making a contribution uh, to help us keep going while our doors are shut and we're all sitting in front of computers and trying to do uh, as much as we can remotely. Uh, so that being said, without any further ado, I want to introduce Ellen Calvis, who is going to start our program off. Ellen, it's all yours. Hello. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, my lighting's not so good. Um, I am happy to continue our film series with the Bedford Playhouse with um, a discussion about a film, uh, Just Eat It, which maybe some of you watched, but if you didn't, that's okay. And we have some fabulous panelists from our community here tonight um, who really do a lot um, of good with food waste. So first, um, let me introduce myself. I'm Ellen Calvis. I'm the program director at Bedford 2020. At Bedford 2020, um, the mission is to lead a community-wide effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and protect our natural resources. Uh, we're currently promoting a new food scrap recycling pilot program uh, and more about that later. But um, part of that effort is also to bring awareness around the problem of food waste. Um, composting is just one solution. Um, and as you probably saw on the film, um, there's a lot of other um, places where food waste is a problem and it needs to be addressed. Let me, um, so if you didn't see the film, it's about a couple who um, ate only food that otherwise would have been wasted for six months. And what they found was there actually was a lot of food to eat because a lot of food goes to waste that's perfectly good and edible, um, which is very frustrating. Um, I want to share my screen with you. Oops, let's see. How does that work? Okay, I'm having... There we go. So I want to share this graphic with you that um, touches on some of the things that were said in the movie. 40% of all food produced in the US is wasted. Uh, that is $161 billion of uneaten food at retailers, restaurants, and homes um, annually. And per capita, this accounts for $1,500 um, per year for a family of four. So uh, an incredible waste. And also you may have seen in the movie this food recovery hierarchy, which is great because it shows that what we really need to do is stop wasting food uh, much higher up on this upside down pyramid um, at the source, uh, especially in our own kitchens, uh, in our own shopping habits, um, and in a lot of planning in, in business and restaurants and, um, and, sh and retailers. Um, and then, you know, the second down is we could feed hungry people with a lot of the, the food that gets wasted. And as you can see, composting is a little bit further down. So we do want to see um, a reduction in food waste um, before we get to um, composting it. But we have two panelists here today um, who are right up at the top here at the source reduction and feed hungry people um, part of the pyramid. So let me introduce them to you. Um, we have Leslie Lampert. 
uh, who's a food waste reduction guru and creator of the Scrappy Chef, Chef series uh, and the proprietor of The Ladle of Love. Uh, and Martha Elder, who's a food rescue advocate and executive director at Second Chance Foods, nonprofit organization dedicated to rescuing unsold, unserved, and aesthetically imperfect food and distributing it uh, in the community to reduce food waste and um, to reduce food insecurity. So Martha and Leslie are going to um, come on to our screen. Hi, Hello, Martha. Everybody. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, we're we're going to start by just hearing from each of them first, um, telling us a little more about what they do. Um, so Martha, why don't you go ahead and start? Tell us about Second Chance Foods. Sure. Thanks, Ellen. I'm so glad to be here tonight. And um, yeah, so Second Chance Foods is a comprehensive food rescue organization. We've been around for four years. We're based up in Putnam County. Uh, we started by rescuing food from uh, grocers and farms and directly distributing that food to food pantries and soup kitchens. And very quickly came to realize that there was a real need for processing food. And so we started um, a kitchen program where we're actually cooking some of the food that we recover into meals. And um, at this point, we're uh, producing just many, many hundreds of meals every week, as well as doing the direct distribution work still. Amazing. And serving people in Putnam County and the surrounding areas? Yep. So we serve a lot of the food pantries from Southern Duchess all throughout Putnam County and into Northern Westchester as well. Yeah, last year we recovered 149,000 pounds of food. Um, it was a huge increase over 2018, and I'm sure 2020 will be even more than that. Great, thanks. And hi, Leslie. Nice to see you. Hi, Ellen. Hi, tell Martha. <laughs> hi, Leslie. So tell us a little about what, about what you do. I will waste no time in telling you that um, I am the proprietor of Ladle of Love, which has been... Uh, in Westchester for the last 17 years. And from day one, we were committed to making sure that we sourced food responsibly. So that means not only where we source it, but how much we source and how we buy. And at no time has there been really any waste because in it, when, we, when I had Cafe of Love, um, what many of you don't know is that no, no waste is called specials. <laughs> so, um, so whenever there's extra food or, or food in inventory that hasn't been utilized one off, those kinds of foods are um, transformed into specials. At Ladle of Love for many, many years, um, being in the soup business and the prepared food business, there is zero waste for us. And I want to start by saying that there are three ways that we can stop wasting food. And one is to um, love ugly food. So even though what we call center of the plate in the restaurant business where you want the perfect tomato and you want the perfect um, look on a peach, the reality is many of those foods and fruits and vegetables become more um, uh, profoundly uh, high, high sweeter and riper. And when they get ugly, they get better for soups and stews and sauces and whatnot. Uh, I, I wanna talk also about how we buy food, how we store food, because storing food is the most important thing. And two years ago, I started a, um, a series called The Scrappy Chef. And I think many of the people who are uh, listening today, watching today, actually, um, I've done many demonstrations over the last couple of years. And I joke that for many years, Sundays in my family would be Scrappy Sunday. I'd go to my, both my daughters and my son, they're working um, moms. And I would go to their home, their apartments on Sundays. And we would just pull everything out of the refrigerator and make the most delicious, healthful meals. And one of the, one, I don't call them recipes, I call them transformations. Martha, I know you understand that because they're not exact recipes. They're understanding what foods can go with what other foods, you know, taking that never ending white rice from the Chinese takeout and transforming that with other, you know, slimy carrots that you wash off and ugly, bruised, rusty uh, greens that, 
are perfectly yummy and delicious when you marry them together and learning how to use those foods in what you know a recipe or a transformation is is really three quarters of the the battle here so um i'm hoping that tonight you know martha and i can really show you guys um and tell you guys how to look at your refrigerator rejects differently look at your pantry what i call pantry pariahs or you know way in the back there differently you know a little bit of this and a little bit of that that's left over when you combine them it makes a beautiful marriage so um and and storing food is a big part of how not to waste food storing it buying properly um and getting to the place composting's great but let's get let's get ahead of composting and let's not have so much to compost thanks um martha do you have anything to add to the the tips to stop wasting food <laughs> um so like Leslie said, um, I don't use recipes a lot. I think if people can learn techniques at home, um, that's a really good thing. Um, learn how to make a really good soup stock. And it's so easy then to make a really good soup with whatever's in your fridge. Um, roasting is a key trick for making things taste really good. Um, you roast it, you know, it gets a little caramelized, develops the sugars, and it's really delicious. Um, you know, I like the idea of, you don't look in your fridge for what do I feel like eating? You look in your fridge for what really needs to be eaten right now, because otherwise it's gonna go to waste. Just kind of a mind shift there. Um, and I really invite you when the food is already in your house, don't even look at the date on it. Because the dates that they put on products are so often really meaningless. Um, use your senses, look at it, does it look okay? Smell it, does it smell okay? Taste it, does it taste okay? Go ahead and eat it. And, and to that point, um, to build on what Martha was saying, please understand that those expiration dates, many of them are not designed, they're not controlled by the agriculture uh, industry. They're controlled by the people, the manufacturers. So when you say that many things, when they say best buy, I mean, for instance, yogurt there's kind of no expiration for yogurt and um, and things that are pickled they get better as they ferment and also don't throw out your pickle juice guys use your pickle juice and make the best vinaigrette ever or take your cucumbers that are looking a little funky slice them up and put them in the bottled pickle juice and voila you you making your own pickles and you already have um, a, a hostage uh, pickling liquid. So to Martha's point, you look in your fridge and you say, um, what do I have to work with? And then you start thinking about how to put those things together. And that's what we're, you know, hopefully tonight going to help you guys do if you have questions. Great. Great. So we do have some questions. So I'll, I'll read some of them um, to get our conversation going. Um, Joe is saying he's interested in rescuing food from supermarkets for distribution to those in need. Is that something that is happening um, with Second Chance Foods or with any of the other um, food rescue organizations in, in this area, Martha? Oh, yep, yeah. yeah, it's happening a lot already. Um, you know, there's different degrees of um, how much, you know, different stores do uh, work with food rescue organizations. Um, but, you know, Second Chance Foods uh, is recovering kind of up in the northern part. There's also um, County Harvest, which covers uh, Southern Westchester County and the Food Bank Feeding Westchester also does recovery work at grocery stores. Um, and, you know, it still doesn't hurt to, if you, if you have a short, excuse me, if you have a store that you shop at regularly, um, to talk to a store manager and to ask, are you working with a food rescue? I really don't want to see food going to waste when our neighbors are hungry. And if we, you know, if we were like this couple in the film and we went to our local grocery stores, would we see these like giant dumpsters full of, you know, hummus <laughs> that's perfectly good to eat? Well, sometimes, yes, unfortunately. Yeah, sometimes you would. Mm -hmm. And if, if someone were to ask a grocery store manager, are you working with like a food rescue organization? And they say, no, what can we do, you know, to sort of, Get, make that happen? Uh, we do have a letter on the Second Chance Foods website that can be shared with stores. 
um, you know, sometimes stewards will say, well, there's liability involved. And, um, you know, that letter explains how they are protected by federal and state legislation. Um, so there's no something ex- called the Good Samaritan Law. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of misconceptions out there about, oh, you know, I could get sued. And um, actually, the law has been around since 90, 1996 and has never had to be used because nobody's ever been sued. Uh, another question, Martha, what do you think um, are the reasons for the increase in food recovery over the past couple of years? Uh, I, first of all, I just think there is so much more awareness of the issue of food waste. Um, you know, there, it's such a huge environmental issue and it's such a um, huge humanitarian issue. Um, it's really no issue that I can think of where they're more inextricably linked and, you know, Thankfully, people are becoming more uh, concerned about the environment and food waste is a huge environmental issue. Um, And then, you know, with COVID-19, just the um, food insecurity is all over the news right now because it is increasing just exponentially. Um, And it's people who have never been to food pantries before. So, you know, both of those issues are really at the forefront right now, humanitarian and environmental. Is it more challenging because of the pandemic to do food rescue now, recovery now, or is it, is it still a good, there's a lot of available? Yeah, there is still a lot of food to rescue, um, especially because, you know, Second Chance Foods was really found out of a desire to improve the quality of food available at food pantries. Over 90% of what we rescue is in the form of fresh produce, and uh, the pandemic hit and everybody wanted to buy food that was in a can or a box or frozen. And so there was a lot of fresh produce that was being donated. It's coming back to a bit more normal at this point, but you know, it was actually even more initially. Great. Um, another question for Leslie. Um, can you wash off slimy vegetables other than carrots? And how do we know which can be rescued? You know, peppers, cucumbers? So is As long as um, things are being uh, stored in the refrigerator, um, they're, they're, they're largely safe and just wash them off. I mean, don't be offended by the color or by uh, the sliminess, of course, you know, even um, just wash it off, cut off the bruised areas that are obviously black and, um, but, but certain things that are mushy, like um, tomatoes, the, the mushier, the more sugar and, they're fabulous for soups and stews and sauces and, uh, you know, even lettuces. Just cut off the parts that are really uh, soft and, and gooey. But when it comes to just a little bit slick, um, just, just rinse it off and then dry it well. And that's the other thing. Uh, store them better. So if you store your produce better, it will last longer. And if it lasts longer, then you'll get more meals out of it also. And the other thing is, um, you know, don't be afraid to blend things. So uh, I have, back in the day, you know, my mom, may she rest in peace, she wasn't the best cook in the world. And if she was following a recipe and she didn't have something, she'd, you know, throw out the whole recipe. But if you don't have this, use that. And use what you like. Um, And just, again, Ugly food is not bad food. Ugly food just means that it's ov- largely overripe. Okay. Um, Tracy is asking, is there a place we can find inspiration or guidance um, as neither of you are fans of recipes? Well, I, I, a recipe is a foundation. You know, it's an architectural blueprint. So. I am a fan of a recipe as a starting point, but I, you know, I I want everybody to understand that there's not a recipe police out there. So if you are following a recipe and it calls for zucchini, but you don't have zucchini, but you have, um, I don't know, uh, red peppers or yellow squash or anything else that, that is in your kale or whatever it is that's in there, just use it and then you'll develop your own recipe. But that's what we, Martha and I mean by transformation is that use what you have and it might, it's not gonna be the same flavor profile, but so what? It'll be a different yummy flavor profile. And you might even find you like that one better and it becomes yours. So start with a recipe and 
I'm sure Martha and I are both ha happy to help with that. Start with a recipe, but don't get married to a recipe. Are there any, well, I guess next, next Monday night, Leslie is going to be back doing a little more of um, some pantry dives. So maybe Tracy can bring some of the items from her fridge and, and yes. bring the question to you. Do these things go together or how do you know what definitely doesn't go together? <laughs> um, yeah. So. You know, it, it mo surprisingly many things that you might not think um, match up together do. And again, you know, cooking is about the layering of flavors and textures. And to that point, you know, recipes are just a starting point. And so for instance, one of the things, and I know Martha is going to agree with this because I see what she does and I think you do an amazing job, Martha. If you have a little bit of quinoa and a little bit of rice and a little bit of barley and a little bit of farro, just put them all together. And then you have this multi-grain dish, whether you'd want to do a risotto dish or a paella dish or whatever, you, you know, don't be afraid to mix and match uh, textures and, 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 and flavors. Even if all their cooking times are different, you can yes. put them all to cook together? Okay. Yes. I mean, so you'll either cook it a little longer and I promise you that the end result, you know, it's a symphony. They're all different instruments, and then you know you're the conductor. You put all of them together, and at the end, there's a mellifluous sound. Awesome. Um, Pink is asking Martha if a store doesn't rescue their food, how do we connect um, you with the store? So um, I mean, it would probably be up to the store to contact us um, mm -hmm. to express their interest in working with us and. They can do that through our website, our phone numbers on there, emails on there, contact submission, all of it's okay. there on our website, secondchancefoods.org. Okay. And we're gonna have a newsletter that goes out um, tomorrow or the next day with, with all of the, any resources that have been mentioned. So the website will be on that follow-up email so people can, can know, check it out, see that letter um, and know how to contact you. Um, and, and maybe, maybe Ellen, what we should do here, this is just, you know, off the cuff, is maybe we should start, you know, with everybody who's listening and then beyond, if they, um, if people go to certain grocery stores and they see that there's a food waste problem in the, in the bin in the back, maybe we start a whole, a, a chain of where these are taking place and then we can start um, as a community talking to those places. Yeah, good idea. Great idea. Emil is saying, why don't they offer more food in smaller packages? Um, this might be for Leslie with the sourcing responsibly um, to minimize the risk of going bad before being used up. For example, it's hard to find a quart of organic milk. It is? Okay. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's two, there's two ways of thinking. Back in the day, everything was in smaller containers and because then it made you buy more frequently. Then Costco came along and then everybody was buying in, you know, massive amounts. I think there are a lot of things that come in smaller um, packages, but um, I, I, you just have to ask your grocer where I don't, you know, where you shop and, or even the manufacturers and the distributors. But I think that if you, if you buy, you know, I'm not suggesting you go shopping every day because that's a wasteful uh, waste of your time and gas and energy also, but try and buy um, in, in the amounts that you'll need say for the week. And then when you're done and you have the surplus, then you have to be contemplative about how to utilize it. Because in addition to the, uh, the pyramid that you put up, Ellen, 40% of what everyone buys in their own refrigerator goes to waste. Whether you're affluent or you're um, limited, 40% of what everybody buys gets trashed. So, um, Camille, to your point, you know, try and buy as much as you can. I don't know the answer about the milk situation, uh, but try and buy tighter than usual. Mm -hmm. And you're right, grocery stores are usually very responsive if you 
tell them that you would like them to carry something. They right. usually try to get it for you. Right. Um, Olivia is saying, is there a law or asking, is there a law in New York requiring supermarkets to donate edible food that would ordinarily be thrown out? Martha, do you have an answer? Um, so there's a law, I think it's come into effect already, but it's they have to be wasting like some huge, huge amount in order to um, fall under that, under that law, like, I don't know, 2,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds a week or, you know, some really humongous number. So not currently, um, but I do feel like that's coming down the pike that, you know, it's what people want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I was um, thoughtful about after I watched uh, Just Eat It was the next, the, you know, part two of Just Eat It should be that we start watchdogging, you know, that, that, big, that big dumpster in the back at the end, remember, with all of the, the hummus, remember that? Yeah. You know, somebody needs to report that. So, um, when that happens, it isn't just it, it isn't just a windfall. It's also something that needs to be uh, managed, and so th their conversations have to start happening with that. So that to me, the follow up is what happens. You know, th there there needs to be a uh, a policing situation about that kind of waste when you find it. Right. Um. Carolyn's asking, do you have any general grocery shopping tips that help reduce food waste? Um, I think it's really smart to start with thinking about what you do want to eat that week um, and meals that you do want to plan for. So you can start with that. And, and, and in my household for, you know, when my kids were little, I, I made the list based on meals that I wanted to make. And generally I was making them on Saturdays and Sundays because I work, I've always worked full time. And to that point, you know, whatever you make, make more of and then freeze it. So you have these, uh, you know, favorite meals in your freezer. Um, and speaking of that, you, frozen vegetables are awesome. Frozen fruit. I mean, I, I just kind of came to this party recently because I've always been a fresh fruit and vegetable person, but, you know, berries that have been frozen at their height are, are, of picking are just berries, and you put them in your freezer, and then you take them when you need them, and for instance, you, you know, making a, a berry crisp, it's awesome, and if you have the fresh berries, you add them all together, but, um, but be contemplative about some frozen things, because they are really a great product, and then I, I would, I would, I would shop thinking about meals, meal planning. Um, Nikki asks, is there any organization working with Costco? Once I saw them remove a huge box of bananas from the shelf because they were slightly brown in spots. Well, first I wanna talk about brown bananas. I want everyone to know that as they ripen and they become ugly with those black spots, they become more nutrient dense. That is a, a fact. You can Google it all right now. So the more brown spots, the more nutritious they are. Um, and I also just wanna say one more thing. When you're making your favorite, <laughs> speaking of bananas, when you're making your favorite banana recipe, double the bananas that whatever the banana uh, recipe says, double them if you have more and it comes out really like pudding-ish. Um, but what was the question? <laughs> well, if, if anyone's going after Costco for um, food waste. Yeah, I think Costco does work with wherever their local food rescue organization is. Um, I think the issue with Costco is it's a separate organization that goes in and does a sampling and um, that that uh, organization doesn't work with the food rescues. That food ends up getting wasted. Right. But the bananas are pulling off the shelf. They're, they're donating those. Okay. Um, and, you can, and also you can freeze bananas, guys. You know this, right? Take them out of their skins and freeze them. And then um, what we do in my world, among the many things, is just throw them in the Vitamix and it makes like a, just a banana ice cream. With, it's just bananas, frozen. Vi blender. Vitamix blender. 
Um, Georgia says, do you think if the supermarkets did not have standards for how produce is supposed to look, then our mindset for buying food would be different? And, and also there was that culture of abundance, those pictures that, you know, in the film of just how we need to see so much food in the produce department. Um, I mean, I think with this pandemic, we, for the first time, probably in a lot of our lives, we're seeing some empty shelves or some things missing and it's just so different from what we're used to. But um, how do we change that mindset of, you know, that food has to look perfect and there has to be tons of it. Yeah, that's exactly it, Ellen. We need just such a cultural mind shift about that every store I could walk in on any day will have everything that I want in abundant quantities. Because uh, that's just not reality. You know, strawberries are not supposed to be available in New York in January. You know, there only are because of our cultural expectations around, you know, having everything available all the time, anywhere we want it. Um, and we really need to, we need a shift around that. And the shift, you know, we eat with our eyes. And of course, we all know that when we're eating as a family and we're creating, um, you know, special meals or whether we're going out to restaurants, our expectation is that we're going to see food presented beautifully. Um, that's totally doable, even with fruits, vegetables, and, uh, and other uh, produce that doesn't start out pretty. So um, I think to, to your point, Martha, there has to be a cultural shift in the education of how we look at what, you know, we're, we're such a, a country of abundance and, and availability, and we're having a big lesson in um, how to still eat well without that that situation taking place right there was the farmer at the farmer's market who said if he only left one i forget what kind of food it was that no one would buy it you know even though it was perfectly good um they would think there was something wrong with it if there was only one but you know it's so funny because i have done this series where i will first show do the reverse i'll show the final result of the recipe which is beautiful yummy and you know to taste it and it looks great and then i show all the ugly ugly produce that was used to make it and it's shocking to people so um you know it's kind of uh again it is about education it's about knowledge it's about shifting the perspective and the perception of what our food should look like and remember you know a lot of these foods they they all start out like that it's just that as they ripen you know like flowers in a bed i mean the tulips aren't going to be upright the whole time but um but they they have beauty at every sort of stage of of their life so it is it, it is a rethinking and i think that that's why we're here now and why we're talking about this it's a, it's a re-education. Yeah. Um, Andy is asking, um, adding the aged cucumber to the pickle jar is a great idea. Is there a place to find other examples of ways to use older food? Next Monday night. <laughs> on, 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 7.30 on, the, on Zoom. <laughs> on Zoom. Um, great. You know, they're all, and, and even, you know, here's another little trick. You have a little you know, you guys probably buy bottled salad dressings. Um, I, I usually make mine because it's really easy. But it, blend them. If you have a little bit of this one and a little bit of that one and this kind of vinaigrette and that, you know, blend them all. And then you're not going to believe, and then shake it up in a mason jar. You're not going to believe how delicious it is. And then you have a whole, new, a whole new salad dressing instead of, you know, a tablespoon at the bottom, which drives me crazy. Don't throw it a tablespoon. There are lots of other tricks like that. And um, I mean, uh, same thing like with sauerkraut is another example. I always use the sauerkraut juice for flavoring other things. It has an acidic quality. It has that pickling quality. A lot of times I'll make um, coleslaw and if I have sauerkraut left over, I use the sauerkraut juice as part of the, that sort of mayonnaise-y um, uh, base that you make coleslaw out of. 
Um, Alexa says in Ireland, there's a food app called Food Cloud, which matches places that have access, excess food, like supermarkets and hotels, with food banks. Is there anything like that here in this area, Martha? Yeah, so we don't use an app, but there are um, some food rescue organizations that do. Food Rescue US um, covers Fairfield County, Connecticut. They have an app. Um, uh, Feed HV covers some parts of the Hudson Valley and they have an app. Um, yeah, so it is a technology that's used locally. Great. Um, Lauren is asking, how can sign up, how can someone sign up to help with food rescue at supermarkets? Uh, well, you could come to our website, again, secondchancefoods.org, and uh, send us a message that you'd like to volunteer. Not easy. Uh, Karen is saying, Leslie, do you have a favorite trick for utilizing older food in one's fridge, like your cucumber pickle one or any other? Oh, this is kind of what Andy asked before. Next Monday night, Karen, you'll get lots more of that, um, those great ideas. Um, Alexa has shared the um, Food Cloud um, website on the, on the Q&A here um, and says, I buy my fruits and veggies from Misfit Market, which rescues from farms. I love getting the box of surprises each week and it makes me cook with what comes to me rather than buying uh, to a super, going to a supermarket and buying more than I need. So that's a great tip to Misfit Market. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, they're adorable. Like you've seen them, Martha, you posted this last week, the carrots that look like they were cheering. <laughs> um, they, you know, it's nature and we want it, it's, they're like people, we want everybody to look different and act different and uh, it's, you know, still have the qualities of delicious food. I think we have to change our minds about A, what beauty is, um, and B, what delicious is. So, you know, these are, these are conversations that have to happen. They're not just, it's not just a, a one recipe. It's really having knowledge about what, what not to listen to about labeling. And I'm sorry, but I'm saying it out loud. And have you, this Misfit Markets, I mean, you've said that you don't have any food waste um, in your business because you use it all. You know, if you can't use it in one dish, you'd make it into a soup or something. What do you think about this model of this, um, I think they ship you, this Misfit Market um, ships food to people, these ugly foods um, to people. So Karen is asking, you know, what do you think about their model? I think it's amazing. And, and to that point, you know, for years, um, when I actually, when I had the restaurant, Cafe of Love, we did business with a lot of the local farms. And at the end of the season, uh, or even during the season, when they had a bumper crop of something that they couldn't sell, or again, things were bruised. I mean, you can't imagine how much corn is thrown out and how many zucchini are throw, thrown out in the herbs. We would, um, we would have an off price uh, menu for them, you know, sale for that. And we had the benefit of getting all of this fabulous food, uh, produce. It wasn't going to waste. I mean, you can't imagine how much waste there is at the farms. So I love the idea of the Misfit program. There's a number of those programs. And I think it's, uh, I think it's terrific. And great, you know, I say for, you know, in my, in the series for The Scrappy Chef, it saves the planet time and money. So it's not just, it's everything. Um, anonymous attendee says, how can we connect the produce discarded by growers to the households in need that are in urban slash suburban areas? Food pantry lines are longer than ever and they could probably use the discards right now. So I think we, we may have, go ahead. Yeah. No, I know that Feeding Westchester, I'm involved in Feeding Westchester, of course, that's, you know, for the food insecure population. And I know that they work with a lot of farms that, um, that, that have these programs. And so what I say to everybody is, yay, be an advocate, take it on. You know, let's, again, Ellen, let's put some of these programs, you know, in action here for, at Bedford 2020. And tonight, you know, we're finding out what people want to do. And so let's, let's have them do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and Second Chance Foods does rescue from farms. Um, we have a gleaning program so that we can actually go onto the farms and into their fields and um, take out their excess or their um, seconds of food that they feel is not marketable. Um, so yeah, that, that effort is happening even in our area. And is that something people can volunteer to help with, the gleaning? Yep, yep, we use volunteers for that as well. So that'll start up kind of June, July probably. Great. And actually, you know, there's nothing wrong with going to, you know, wherever your local farmer's market is and where you shop, ask them. Ask them, volunteer, talk to them, start the conversation. This all happens by talking. And right now, especially during this quarantine and pandemic, you know, environment, everything, should, talk about everything because that's how ideas get action. Um, Deborah asks, do you have any specific tips for food storage to maximize fridge slash pantry life? I do. Martha, you, do you want to start? Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, boy, gosh, a few things. Um, so, like, if you bring, when you bring your berries home, don't wash them right away. They'll last yeah. longer if you don't. Um, your lettuces, I actually, I do like to wash my lettuces and, you know, get them really dry in a salad spinner and put them in a bag and they last for a long time that way. Um, I just want to say too, like actually just prepping my vegetables when I get home from the market, um, just helps me use them much more readily if it's all set to go and I'm tired after a long day at work, but the green beans are all washed and snapped and ready to cook. Um, much more likely to use them while they're still fresh. Um, you know, your freezer is your friend for sure. Uh, if you see things, you know, getting close to, they need to get used up, but you can't use them right away. Put them in your freezer, um, your blender, you know, make yourself a smoothie, stock pot, make some good stock that you can make soup with. Um, I'll pass it over to Leslie. Um, ditto. <laughs> but I also, we joke around that we have a vase in our refrigerator and it's kept with a few inches of water and all the herbs go in there and that nourishes the herbs, the fresh herbs, because it, you know, it obviously waters them from the stems up. So that's part, that's number one. And the other thing um, about food storage is, you know, keep a Ziploc bag in your refrigerator and or your freezer. And when you're cutting celery, to, you know, to the point if you're going to, to Martha's point, if you're going to prep it, take the butt of the celery, shove it in the Ziploc bag. Take the ends of the carrots and, you know, shove it in the bag and keep um, it, these are for, to, make, to make stocks and soups and, and, and bases for sauces. Because again, all of that is going to go into the ground, which is going to create a greenhouse uh, gas effect, which we don't want. And let's utilize it. And so if we utilize it in making stocks and making sauces, um, it will be better for the planet. And it will be better for your household because everything tastes better when you're making, you know, when you're not using those bouillon cubes. Don't use those. <laughs> Great. Um, Alexa asks, is there a bulk buying supermarket in our locale like we saw in the film? I know, uh, like Whole Foods has their bulk bins. Um, I don't know of a market that's 100% bulk buying in our area. Right, I don't either. Should be. I, don't, <laughs> I don't know either. But uh, again, I, I, I really, really want to um, stress having conversations with your, the farmers at, when you go to the farmer's market. Really start conversations, talk about not just what you're going to buy that day, talk about what they need to sell, talk about what you want to buy, you know, start a real conversation with them that starts before your, your purchase at, at, on that day at the farmer's market. See how you can help them. That's good. Pink is um, asking, Leslie, can you talk about how to substitute one thing for the other? Absolutely, but you need to give me a context. Um, let's see. Pink, do you want to, uh, let's see. I don't know how uh, she could, 
I don't know how this Q and A thing works. If she could put it in, but um, we'll come back to it. Maybe she'll type it in. Um, Ashley, do you have any tips? Is asking, do you have any tips to make your vegetables crisper longer beyond putting them in the crisper in your fridge? Or is that the best solution? Um, there are a number. It, it, it depends. You know, water content has a big play in how things. Uh, stay fresh. So for instance, mushrooms, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to put water in mushrooms because they're sponges and they'll absorb it. You don't want to touch them until you're ready to use them. Um, a lot of times what I do is I use paper towels and wrap my produce in, in paper towels without wetting them. And that helps absorb moisture as as it stays in the crisper and that seems to help it last longer um great um thomas asked leslie i noticed that sometimes greens don't endure well even after storing them well uh what is the best way to store greens such as spinach different varieties of lettuce for maximum life and how can one use wilted leaves in a recipe or into a puree of some sort so um, I, love, I love blending all greens together and make like a greens pesto. I mean, I'm a pesto girl. So, and when I say pesto, yes, I love basil and I like to throw in a handful of basil, but I make pestos out of just greens also. And so I guess it's not really a pesto, but it's a pureed condiment like a um, gremolata or a chimichurri. Uh, and then I, you freeze them in little quantities and you have them as sauces for pasta and um, sandwich spreaders and uh, uh, mixing into stews. To keep them fresher, as I said, you, you wanna keep them as dry as possible. It, um, as opposed to herbs, which you wanna keep uh, the stems in water so that they stay hydrated. Okay. Um, Fiona is asking, um, what about waste food, food waste from schools when schools are in session? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we do rescue from schools as well. I didn't mention that. Um, and then when the schools so suddenly closed for the pandemic, two of our local districts uh, did donate to Second Chance Foods uh, many, many thousands of pounds of milk and yogurts and uh, produce. You know, not all the school districts are doing it yet. You know, again, some of them think there's some kind of liability involved. Um, you know, but as I think more school districts do it and they see that, um, you know, it's perfectly safe and legal for them to do, but hopefully more will do it. And is that something else people could volunteer to help with, um, like picking up food from schools if they say, you know, set it aside? Yeah, once the uh, schools are back in session. Right. Number. Right. And um, is picking up food from like supermarkets and, and places something that Second Chance Foods does need help with? Uh, I mean, currently, no. Um, you know, all of our regular food runs are covered by regular volunteers. And um, I mean, a beautiful thing that has come out of this pandemic with people working from home is volunteers. We have so many people who are wanting to help, which is really wonderful. Um, it's just hard to employ all of them. Right. Um, just a couple of some re questions here. Um, what do you think about the meal kits that get delivered? Does this help the problem since you only get the amount of food that you need or is it not the right answer? Leslie's shaking her head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry, but number one, um, you know, they serve a purpose, but it's an, you know, it's a, it's a lot of containered food. It's a lot of one shot food. And this might sound contradictory, but I, I do believe we're better off buying a week's worth of food and then figuring out how to put that together. Um, I, uh, I think there are some other associated issues with the meal, kit, meal kits for, for waste problems. Okay. Um, Lauren asks, um, what is the best way to save bread that's gotten too hard to eat? Oh, Martha and I could have a field day with this, right, Martha? 
Yeah, I don't ever buy breadcrumbs. You know, just uh, put those into your food processor and make the breadcrumbs, stick them right in the freezer. And uh, yeah. A hundred percent. And the other thing is, every bread pudding in the whole world, sweet bread pudding, savory bread puddings, um, we, we make uh, custards that are not, that don't have sugar in them. And so sometimes we do a sausage, egg, and cream cheese bread pudding. Sometimes we do a smoked salmon and cream cheese bread pudding. Um, there's so many things you can do with bread. And the other thing is that um, you want to make sh croutons, things, Caesar salads, the most delicious croutons. You want that bread to be a little stiff. You cut a baguette on the bias, you let it dry out, olive oil, and I like, you know, turmeric, shove it in the 450 oven and you get these toasts and you keep them like crostinis and they keep for a while. All kinds of things you can do, but don't ever buy breadcrumbs is right. Great. Um, here's a good, here's a, con a question to contemplate. If there were signs and advertisements in supermarkets about how much food we waste daily, do you think people would be more inclined to buy less food? Well, I don't think the supermarkets want you to buy less food, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure the signs would go up. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think like Leslie was saying before, when you go to the supermarket, you know, have your list with you, have your meals planned, and you know, buy the appropriate amount of food. Um, Nikki asked, what's the solution? I'm going a little faster because we only have a couple minutes left. Um, what's the solution when a group has a catered meeting after this pandemic um, is over uh, and ends up with leftover wraps or other prepared food? Is there anywhere for that food to go? Yeah, uh, you know, especially some of the um, homeless shelters really appreciate that food depending on where you're located. Um, you know, there's like Jan Peak and Peak Skills and Christopher Zen up in Garrison. Um, you know, I'm sure plenty of uh, programs down in Southern Westchester as well who would take that food. Um, Leslie, is there any type of education effort for chefs to teach them about buying bruised and ugly produce from farmers so they don't need to waste it? I don't know if there's a, um, a concrete program, but I know that you know, many of my colleagues and, and chef rest, at restaurants absolutely have relationships with farms and farmers and, um, and organizations, particularly in the city, I think they're a little bit ahead of the curve. Up here, I just, you know, we are among many, because we're right at the mouth of the Hudson Valley and all of these, all of the wonderful farms, many of us in the restaurant business have these relationships with the farms and have been having uh, these off price end of summer relationships for a while. But I don't know of any formal uh, organization here. I think there's one actually out in, uh, way out east in, in Long Island called East End, um, but check it out. Yeah, let, let me know. In terms of restaurants sourcing food, I mean, I, I would assume that the more, the closer you were to having exactly the right amount, the more money you would save. Is there anyone that teaches, you know, businesses how to do that? Oh, of I mean, inventory is the entire game of, you know, buying food and inventory is the entire business game of the restaurant business, you know, no matter what food aspect you're in, restaurants, takeout, catering, whatever. So understanding how to buy, and this is why, um, I, you know, I feel uniquely suited to talk to the home cook about it because it's all about inventory. That's really what we're talking about. What you inventory in your pantry, what you inventory in your refrigerator. And uh, that is how successful restaurants model. It's all about what you buy, how you buy, how much you buy of it, what, you know, what the cost is, communicating with your sources for what you're, what you want to pay. And it's all about inventory. Right. Um, here's a question from, Fa I guess we're streaming on Facebook Live as well. A uh, question from Facebook Live. Rosalind says, how do we reduce food waste with meat, which can have issues like salmonella when kept longer? And uh, if it gets up to that date, the sell-by date, just stick it in your freezer and use it another time, that's what I would say. 
and and date everything. So, um, Mar you know, Martha's a hundred percent right. You wait, you try and use it to the sell by date, but if you can't, and and that is monitored by the agricultural uh, industry. So, you, if you don't use it within a couple days then you throw it into the freezer, but make sure you date it so that when you, when you defrost it, you don't use it past those couple days. Great. Um, someone had pantry moths and had to get rid of everything, um, which is so sad, um, and just found another moth and it's killing her to have to, um, to throw everything out again. Is there any way to save any of it or does everything have to go? with pantry moths? Well, obviously anything canned is fine because it's protected. But if you have pantry moths and they're getting into the food, it's contaminated. So I'm, I wouldn't be comfortable with that. And, you know, I'm pretty comfortable rescuing most things. But, you know, once How the do food- How you avoid um, getting pantry moths again if you've had them before? I think I've heard that when you bring home your grains from the market to put them in the freezer, for some period of time, because that's how they get into your house in the first place is um, through the food that you're purchasing. So if you put it in the freezer, you'll kill anything that's in there and, and you'll be okay. Okay. All right, we, ha we still have so many questions. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I don't know when Dan's gonna cut us off, but um, I just wanna look through and see if there's some very different ones. Lauren says that BD Provisions has two bulk stores in Connecticut, open through the pandemic. So that is great. Um, let me see if, uh, who's chatting? Oh, okay. Looking at the Q and A. Um, a let's see, sorry. The waste associated with celery trimming for packaging we saw in the film was shocking. Mm -hmm. How do we go about driving change around that kind of packaging driven waste of fresh farmed food? Same thing with romaine hearts, you know, same thing, you know, and it, again, you know, we're talking about um, producing food that looks good. Um, but the waste is, is um, you know, it's, it's criminal <laughs> and there's so many, uh, it's all about make, you know, packaging it and presenting it so that the consumer feels they're getting something pretty. But in fact, I'm much happier getting the whole celery. First of all, everybody, here's a tip. When you get your celery, you know, I've been doing, uh, we've been making a lot of food for frontliners at the hospitals. And one of my favorite salads is I take an entire bunch of celery, don't trim it, I love the celery leaves, they taste delicious. Just chop it all up really fine, and it's crunchy. And then, you know, cucumbers and everything crunchy, red peppers, no lettuce. I mean, I love lettuce too, but this is a crunchy salad, but don't, you know, the things that you, we've been taught to discard, like the feathery leaves of the fennel and the, and the little celery leaves, they're precious. They're fabulous. And when you start incorporating them into your recipes and your salads, you're going to say, why, why didn't I know this? Why didn't I do this? I don't know the answer to how to, you know, I think this is, again, a conversation that we're opening up and we've been talking about for a couple of years now, more than a couple of years, of um, how to shift to the mentality of the consumer, which then will shift the mentality of the um, distributor. And I would say, so if at your store, you have the option of buying the whole um, head of romaine or the, you know, the whole bunch of celery instead of the, just the hearts, then do that, um, you know, send the message that you want the whole product. Great. All right. There's a couple tips here. Use cloth towers instead of paper towels when you wrap your greens. Um, oh, oh to answer exactly the milk right. question, yes. you you can freeze your milk um, when you can't drink all of it. Um, and for mushroom storage, uh, keep mushrooms in a paper bag in the fridge so they don't get slimy. Um, they only dry out and you can reconstitute them in soup even after months. So some nice tips from our audience. 
Um, so I think, I think we got the bulk of the, the questions answered. Um, thank you so much. That was really interesting. We covered a lot of things and um, we're looking forward to um, next week. I have, I have a couple of slides um, to show. Let's see. There it is. And don't forget the poll, Ellen. There's also the poll. Yeah, I don't, we don't have to do the poll. Okay. <laughs> Um, but I do want to show you, whoops, those were the poll. Um, we do have a compost, curbside compost coming to the town of Bedford. Sign up started today and the first 75 people who want to get curbside pickup of their food scraps um, uh, will get it. Um, and are one of the first 75, you can, you can do this for one year for $15 or less. So it'll be subsidized by a grant um, if you get in the program the first year. So that is um, curbside pickup. Leslie is back next Monday, the Scrappy Chef via Zoom, and will give us more tips and tricks to um, avoid going to the dreaded grocery store, which I just hate doing these days. And I think everyone else does too. Um, and use up what we have in our refrigerator. We also have another film coming with the Bedford Playhouse in June, uh, The Story of Plastic. And we're working on getting some really great experts to come talk about the solutions. Uh, and this is a, a really interesting film. Um, I just watched it. And so we will offer a link where you can see it for free and then join us for session on June 8th. This Wednesday, we have a very cool um, lunch and learn session at noon. Um, it's the En-ROADS Climate Simulation Simulator um, that uh, helps us understand kind of what needs to happen to uh, keep the global uh, average temperature below uh, rise the, where it needs to be so that um, climate change isn't happening at the rate that it's happening. Um, and on Thursday, we have our dig-ins, which are every Thursday from 5 to 5.30. They're short, fun, interactive, and they focus on um, healthy yards and sustainable food. And we're talking about how to get rid of the invasive species in your yard, how to identify them, get rid of them, and what to replace them with. So um, thank you um, for joining us. And thank you to the Bedford Playhouse and the Whedon Foundation for being our partners in the environmental film series. Um, please, please, during this time, um, consider supporting um, Bedford Playhouse for all that they're doing for our community and of course Bedford 2020 as well. Um, so Dan, do you have anything else to say? Uh, no, just uh, one other thing is if for anybody's interested, if you go to our homepage, bedfordplayhouse.org, we have a lot of virtual programming uh, and you can check out, there's all kinds of different stuff. There's some streaming films. Uh, we have some interactive Q and A's. Um, there's next month's uh, story of plastic, which will be up very soon. Um, so something to keep everybody busy while we're getting through these times together. Great. Thank you, Leslie and Martha. That was fantastic. We really appreciate you spending time with great. us. Thank you. It's been great to be here. Okay. Good night, Love everybody. you guys. Good night. Take care. Stay, stay safe and nourished, everybody. You too. Amen to that. Okay. Good night. Good night. All right. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. I wanted to read the... Okay.